so today I will be talking about uh, serial converters, which are um, these devices which exist on a lot of industrial networks. Uh, so these are uh, protocol converters, which take old serial equipment and sometimes new serial equipment and connect that equipment to IP networks. Uh, so these serial converters are used in all industries in the industrial space. Uh, we see them regularly in power plants. Uh, we see them as devices which do electric metering. We also see them uh, in the oil and gas industry, both at refineries and on pipelines. These devices are also used in some non-industrial uh, roles, like point-of-sale terminals and for connecting uh, Internet of Things devices uh, up to IP networks and just miscellaneous other systems, maybe hospital networks, that sort of thing. Um, so there are a lot of different types of these converters. Uh, the, the most basic ones will take a you know, RS-232 serial device and connect it to an Ethernet network. Uh, but there are a lot of different kinds that connect uh, different uh, serial uh, standards like RS-422, RS-485, to a variety of IP networks. Uh, you know, they might, be, they might have a Wi-Fi converter in them, they might have a, a cellular modem inside of them. Some of them even do like 900 megahertz, what's called the ISM band, uh, the, the license-free spectrum, uh, yeah, just regular RF communications. Um, so we did this research project on serial converters uh, when I was with Digital Bond, uh, under Digital Bond Labs. Uh, we did this project in June to July of 2015. Uh, Corey Thune, who was with Digital Bond at the time, and myself uh, did research on a number of different uh, serial converters. Um, so since the research happened, uh, so we did the research in June, July, um, and then in December of 2015, there was a kind of famous incident now involving serial converters, and this was the Ukraine blackout. So uh, hackers broke into an electric utility in Ukraine, and part of the attack they performed was to, uh, to brick or denial of service these MOXA uh, serial converters. Uh, the MOXA UC line. Now we didn't look at the MOXA UC line, we looked now at two or three other lines of serial converters which had some serious uh, security issues that we'll talk about. Uh, but uh, you know, we did contact MOXA um, in, uh, shortly after we did our research project, uh, so it was more than six months before the Ukraine incident happened, uh, we contacted MOXA and said, hey, you have some serious security problems in your product. Um, and we had no ability to get them to, to respond. Um, so uh, we did, after, after the Ukraine incident happened, we did a, a limited public disclosure uh, where we said, here, here are the general class of vulnerabilities in these devices, uh, just to warn end users that they really should be doing something to protect the devices on their network. Um, so. Uh, we picked, uh, for the project, we picked the big name vendors, this, the equipment that we see at many facilities. Uh, so we looked at a number of devices from Moxa. Uh, we also looked at devices from uh, Lantronix, Grid Connect, and another company called Digi. Uh, so these are the products that we specifically tested uh, through the research, uh, although we actually tested a few additional Moxa devices uh, just because the Ukraine incident made us very more interested in, in those converters. Um, so the Moxa devices I'll, I'll jump into first. Uh, they're all quite similar in features and functionality. Uh, and in fact, there has been some other research done on these products since our, our research. Uh, Rapid7 in uh, March of 2016 published their own advisory about MOXA endport devices, uh, and they detailed that uh, many of these devices are configured without passwords uh, and that they're accessible on the internet uh, with no password set in them. So anybody uh, on the internet can log into the device with no password and change its configuration uh, without the uh, owner's consent. Um, of course, for our research project, we looked quite a bit deeper at the protocol and figured out that there are some even bigger issues than, than uh, null credentials. Um, so first, I want to do a little bit of a teardown, because that's what we do in, in the Revic security. We tear equipment apart and uh, find, you know, how are we going to exploit vulnerabilities once we find them? 
Um, so we took apart the MOXA devices and found that they use a, an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit. Uh, the ASIC has a MOXA part number on the chip. Uh, it is the main CPU of their, their uh, serial converter. Um, but we found out that it's really just uh, a, an old 16-bit processor called the RDC R8822 with some additional features added onto that chip. Um, it turns out figuring out what it was was pretty easy um, because we bought a number of these converters. Well, one of them that we bought was made about five years prior to the newest one, and it had these RDC chips in it. You know, we could verify power pins and other pinouts and figure out that their chip uh, was the same one being used in the newer, uh, the newer uh, converters. So this is a picture of the newer device. This is an uh, N-port 5110. Um, so this here is the, uh, the MOXA CPU. It's, a, like I said, a 16-bit uh, processor. Um, it has a strange instruction set. There are no commercial disassemblers for this CPU that I know of. Um, and this is a picture of the uh, N-port uh, 6110. This is strangely, even though the name sounds like it's newer, it's actually a much older product. Uh, and so this uses the, uh, the RDC processor. And uh, the reason that you will see a lot more pins, so this is a 128-pin processor, uh, and this is a 100-pin processor. They took this uh, external Ethernet controller and uh, put it on the CPU die. So now this uh, processor has Ethernet and serial converters. And so this, this Ethernet Phi connects the, the CPU or connects the Ethernet uh, connector to, directly to the CPU, whereas on the older model, the Ethernet uh, port would go through the Ethernet Phi to the uh, Ethernet converter itself and then connect to the CPU. Um, so the MOXA N port sits on an Ethernet network, um, and it has a number of services open for configuring the device. Uh, it has Telnet, uh, the secure shell. It also can use HTTP or HTTPS for configuration, and it supports the simple network management protocol. The most interesting part, though, was that it supports this uh, two proprietary protocols that MOXA invented or paid someone to invent for them. Uh, I suspect it's the latter, uh, but uh, these management protocols use UDP port 4800 and TCP port 4900. Um, these protocols are, are probably the most interesting from a security point of view. Um, so a quick look at the web interface. This is for the N port 5000 series. Uh, the web interface, the web server that it has on it, doesn't have much in terms of security. Um, you know, it uses an insecure cookie for authentication, so it's easy for someone to trick a management computer into giving up the uh, authentication token. Uh, it also has cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and other common web vulnerabilities. But it also has a buffer overflow bug that's, that's pretty bad, and I'll talk about that more uh, when we look a little bit deeper at the web interface. Um, but those management protocols that I talked about on, on 4800 and 4900 are, are probably most interesting. Uh, so there's a special tool you can get from Mox's website, uh, which uh, you can download this tool and use it to configure the uh, N-Port devices, and that tool is called the N-Port Search Utility. Uh, it uses uh, UDP port 4800 to communicate with N-Port devices. Um, so most of the devices that we've looked at don't really require any authentication to use this protocol. Um, and in most of the devices we looked at, you can actually retrieve the administrator's password for the, the uh, converter. Um, and every device we looked at, you can retrieve SNMP credentials from the device without authenticating. Uh, so if you understand the protocol, you can get these passwords from the device. Um, the N-Port 6000 series, though, uh, you cannot get the password, at least using this protocol, from the device. It's the 5000 series, uh, and then there are a number of other uh, devices that you can get the uh, password from. I think the, the uh, what do they call it, the on-cell device, which I think is their cellular gateway. They also have a newer Modbus serial gateway called the M-Gate uh, that you can retrieve passwords from. Um, so, yeah, the, the, uh, the proprietary protocol, yes, will work with not just N-port devices, but these on-cell and M-gate uh, uh, devices, and you can get the administrator password from those. 
Um, so the MOXA protocols are already sort of publicly known. Uh, since all this MOXA stuff happened with uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, people have developed uh, search engine scans for these uh, devices. You can now go on Shodan and find uh, uh, just over 5,000 of these serial converters uh, on Shodan. There's also a Chinese PLC research group uh, called Z1. Uh, their website also lists a number of these MOXA converters on it. Um, the protocol itself uh, is pretty basic, and we'll go over that. Um, but it just uses a simple function code, and the only real security on the protocol is you have to know the uh, Ethernet address of the device. But you can ask it for its Ethernet address using the protocol. So, and uh, that's uh, kind of trivial to defeat. Uh, this is an example of the protocol itself. Uh, so if you want to find the device Ethernet address, you just have to send these eight bytes to it, and it will respond with uh, a packet uh, containing its Ethernet address. So the first byte of the packet is uh, a function code, and the first byte of the response is a response function code. So the function codes are 0 through 127, and then the response function codes are 128 through 255. And they always just set the uh, most significant bit to a 1 uh, in the response. So you send a, a request with 1, you get a response with 81. If you send a request with 2, you would get 82. Um, the response uh, structure is basically this response function code. Then there are three bytes here for a length field. Um, then there are these pad bytes that I don't know what they mean. Um, but then they reply with the device model number. Uh, this is a format called binary coded decimal. So this is a 5110 that we actually looked at. And so it has the 5110. It repeats that response, uh, that model number, uh, later in the packet for reasons that we don't know. Um, and then it responds with the device MAC address, the 0090E8, uh, et cetera. And then it finally appends the IP address uh, uh, encoded in binary. So the, the function codes that you can use for defeating the security of the MOXA are uh, function code 1 to receive that device identifier. Uh, function code 40 retrieves uh, SNMP configuration information and function code 41 will retrieve an administrator password. So we can easily build uh, IDS signatures, and in fact, we've worked with some companies to help them uh, develop IDS signatures for the, this issue. Um, uh, so that uh, is the, the uh, MOXA endpoint management protocol issue. Uh, so now we'll talk about the web server a bit. Um, so the web server had some very basic vulnerabilities. Uh, one of them I mentioned was a buffer overflow. So if we issue get or post requests to uh, any of the, the parts of the web server uh, and we just set a parameter value to a long string of A's, uh, the device crashes. Uh, and it does have a watchdog inside, so it will reboot. Usually a reboot takes somewhere around 30 seconds, and then it comes back online. But this is a single packet you can send to the device and, and crash it. And it's probably possible to get remote code execution on the device using this bug. Uh, but I mentioned that uh, the CPU is kind of a strange one, so there aren't a lot of uh, exploit tools for this, this small embedded CPU. Uh, I think it would take uh, quite a bit of work to develop a functional exploit, uh, and not something that I'm really interested in doing. Um, the, uh, so on the web server, uh, some more details about the other vulnerabilities on, on the web server. Uh, the Nport 5000 series has all of the web vulnerabilities like the uh, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, uh, basically no data sanitization done on that. The uh, Nport 6000 models that, that actually have a web server in them, not all of them do, uh, but they do protect a lot of the variables uh, through use of character escaping, so that's good. Uh, but it's some, some strange uh, problems with that are uh, if we do insert some escaped characters, we can cause at least form fields to no longer display properly, uh, even if we can't get cross-site scripting working. So probably we could get uh, cross-site scripting working in the future. Um, so uh, uh, as a timeline, uh, we reported the issues to MOXA in July of 2015. Uh, 
Um, and in December of 2015, the Ukraine blackout happened where a MOXA device was, was uh, targeted. Um, in January of 2016, we decided uh, we should publish an advisory just to inform users. Um, we also you know, informed ICS CERT of these issues. Um, and uh, MOXA replied uh, and said, uh, you know, they will fix this, uh, they will fix all the device bugs by August. Uh, but August has come and gone, and there's no firmware update for any of the endport models yet. So we feel there are probably no patches coming, or at least that they're going to come much, much too late. Uh, so we're doing some limited public disclosure at this time. Um, so that's everything about the, the MOXA devices. Uh, let's talk about Lantronics next. Um, so we actually grouped Lantronics and Grid Connect uh, into one, one category, and we'll, we'll see why when we look at the hardware. But we, uh, we looked at the, the Lantronics uh, UDS 2100 and the Grid Connect Net 232 Plus. Uh, these, these devices are quite clearly an OEM relationship uh, because the Grid Connect device has a CPU inside of it with a Lantronics logo on it. Uh, so even though these companies are competitors, they are buying chips from each other. Uh, so um, there are a lot of devices uh, on Shodan that respond to this Lantronics, uh, well, that respond to a Lantronics fingerprint. I think there are something like 13,000 or maybe it's 30,000, I actually don't remember the number. Um, but we see these Lantronics chips are actually in a lot of devices that I didn't talk about in the beginning. Uh, there's an emergency alert radio system that uses this chip uh, for configuration. There are also a lot of other digital radios that, that use these Lantronics serial converters for uh, configuring the devices. So this is a photo of the inside of the uh, Grid Connect converter. And you can see here the CPU that it uses is a, a Lantronics chip. We didn't remove the shield from the CPU, but uh, you know, we can see quite clearly that at least it has the Lantronics logo on it. Um, and then this is a chip, uh, the main CPU that was inside of the uh, Lantronics converter itself, which is a proprietary system on a chip. Uh, we wanted to learn a little bit more about the CPU that both of these controllers use, so we started looking through uh, a kind of famous website called archive.org, uh, and we found some press releases. Uh, I think this was in the early 2000s that, that Lantronics made some press release saying that, uh, hey, they were developing their own chip. Uh, that chip was uh, based on the Intel 80286 processor. Um, and that they even said what uh, C compile or C++ compiler they used uh, for developing software with Lantronics. Uh, they even said what operating system they're running. So you can find this information uh, in this this old press release. Um, so that helps us if we find you know buffer overflow bugs, we can maybe find some nice way of exploiting them. So similar to the Moxa, we wanted to look, okay, what is the network footprint of these devices? So they use uh, Telnet, uh, HTTP, TFTP, which uh, is a protocol with no ability to do authentication, uh, as well as a proprietary management protocol. We sense maybe a theme here that uh, both Moxa and Lantronics use some protocols that they invented for, for doing their configuration. Um, so this UDP password, uh, this protocol does support a password. Um, the default configuration of the device is a, a four-character password. Uh, so that password uh, is, I believe it's actually limited to four numeric digits. So it's like a four-digit pin. Uh, the protocol has no brute force protection on it. The protocol also has no encryption. So um, you, know, you can guess all four-digit passwords in, in pretty quick time. Uh, when you understand the protocol and, and break into the device. Um, and actually, if you are using this uh, insecure password mode, you don't have to authenticate. You can request the passcode from the device with, without knowing the passcode. Um, there, uh, it turns out this was discovered by some other researchers uh, years ago. Uh, so there was a researcher named Rob Vinson who looked at the simple password problem in 2012. Uh, and there's another researcher, Vlatko Kosteryak, I guess that's how you pronounce his name. Um, he wrote uh, some enhanced password tools to help break the enhanced password uh, format in, in 2014. 
So you can Google for their names and they have uh, GitHub pages where you can download uh, code for uh, you know, grabbing passwords from devices. Of course, we built our own uh, simple password tool before finding the, uh, the uh, Rob Vincent's simple password tool. Oops, probably should have uh, searched harder for other research on these before writing our own. Um, both of the manufacturers, Grid Connect and Lantronics, they both use the same web server. Uh, they perform data sanitization on the web server using JavaScript. So uh, if you bypass the JavaScript restrictions, you can uh, configure the device with settings that make no sense. Uh, so right, you can configure uh, uh, listening ports that are too large to fit in a, a two-digit port number, right? a two-byte port number. You can configure like an Ethernet maximum transfer size that's bigger than in a value that's allowed by the Ethernet standard. Um, so you can also set the password to something that's not in ASCII, so someone would have a hard time typing it in if they wanted to authenticate to the device. Uh, you can have all kinds of fun if you, uh, if you exploit the web server. Um, the next up is that TFTP server. They use that for uh, doing firmware updates, uh, for transferring firmware to the device. The firmware itself is not uh, a signed firmware, so if you uh, understand uh, x86 assembler, you can modify the firmware and upload your own to the device. Uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, we did uh, repeatedly contacted Grid Connect and Lantronics for over a year. Uh, we tried many different avenues, both friends in the industry, uh, you know, just contacting their sales folks uh, and never received any response. You know, we just said, hey, we found some serious security problems. We would like to talk to somebody about them and they just never would answer. So uh, I think that uh, the best defense maybe is at least informing end users about the security issues in the products. Uh, uh, so finally, we have the Digi One SP. This is the last uh, controller that we'll be looking at. Uh, so we tested this Digi One SP product. I don't have a photo of the inside of it, unfortunately, um, but it uses a cold fire processor, which is a Motorola chip. Um, there wasn't any obvious uh, debugger header inside of the the uh, Digi One SP which is a good thing. Uh, however, the CPU that they used has no security features, uh, so there's no way to disable debugging. So we could use a soldering iron and uh, make our own header. Uh, so that's kind of bad. And the CPU also has no way of doing real firmware protection. So there would be no way to implement an encrypted firmware or assigned firmware for the device that uh, would really be useful. Um, so the network footprint for this device for management services are HTTP, Telnet, uh, and a proprietary management protocol again. This one uses UDP port 2362. Um, so the converter itself uh, was a little bit better than other converters uh, because there was no obvious way to retrieve the password from the device like there were with the other devices. But uh, in some ways, it was much worse than the other devices. Uh, there were some very basic IP stack vulnerabilities uh, in this. So if we send a packet with a malformed TCP header, uh, where we set, the, this is the data offset field inside of the TCP header, that field has to be a value between five and I believe 20. Uh, if you set it to a value less than five, the device crashes. Uh, so that's maybe not so good. Their, you know, their protocol stack didn't go through really basic conformance testing. Uh, we uh, also found that the configuration tool, which runs on a Windows PC, uh, similar to the Moxa configuration utility, um, that tool actually contains buffer overflows. Uh, so um, at least the tool didn't give us a way to retrieve the password, but uh, the tool has this bug in it. Um, so this bug is that uh, if we set the length of the packet to be uh, bigger than the actual packet is, uh, we, so the, the protocol basically works by having D-I-G-I, that's digi in hexadecimal, uh, followed by this 0002, uh, which is probably means version two of the protocol, I guess, followed by a length field. Uh, and if we set that length field to a very large value, like 65,535, uh, and there is, no, there is not actually 65,535 bytes of data in the packet, uh, then the PC software crashes. 
it, it crashes, uh, probably trying to access unallocated memory. Um, so this is probably a heap corruption bug or something uh, in the Windows software. Um, on older operating systems, it's very likely that we could exploit this to you know, gain privileges to the system that's running the configuration software. Um, uh, newer operating systems, of course, it would be more difficult to, to achieve that. Um, so we actually received a response from Digi on this one, although it wasn't a very good response. Um, uh, Digi informed us that the Digi One SP device was not meant to be a secure device and that we should, uh, if we want a secure device, we should look to their newer, more secure product lines uh, and that they weren't going to fix uh, issues found in their controllers. So I, I should note that these devices are still being manufactured and sold today as new. Uh, so I don't really like that response, but uh, they, they're a big company. They can decide how they want to deal with security issues uh, uh, on their own. Um, so of course now we are releasing some details, hopefully to put some pressure, maybe customers can pressure Digi to, to fix some of these bugs. Um, I think the, the big lesson maybe to learn from this is that these uh, proprietary protocols used for configuring the devices are, are a big risk area. Uh, I think the, the biggest vulnerabilities we saw were in these, these proprietary management protocols. And these protocols have bugs both for the, the field device as well as the PC software. Um, so we can, at least the, in this case, these protocols were quite simple. Uh, we understood what the function codes meant. Uh, we could figure out what length fields were. Uh, so we can develop uh, intrusion detection signatures for uh, these protocols. Of course, our understanding of the protocol is based on reverse engineering. There may be bad assumptions that we make uh, in developing the IDS signatures. Uh, you know, there's always that risk. Uh, the, probably the best people, uh, best qualified people to make IDS signatures for the protocols would be the vendor itself. Uh, but I don't know that that's going to happen. Um, we also know that uh, even these denial of service bugs or, or configuration change bugs can have a huge impact for a real control system. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, uh, they were not able to restore power uh, because the uh, circuit breaker uh, you know, reclose commands that were being issued were being issued through a serial converter, uh, and the serial converter had been bricked, uh, so those commands didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, so then they had to send, you know, people out to the substations to the field to actually reconnect power to people. Uh, so uh, an outage of these devices can be pretty bad. And it, it doesn't have to be bricking the device, right? You could even change a very basic configuration setting in the device using these vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, you could change the IP address uh, of the, the serial converter and a human machine interface would no longer be able to communicate to it which is effectively the same thing. Uh, so you would have to send someone out to the field to fix the problem. Um, and also that management software, like I said, has some interesting bugs uh, in it. So that could be another attack avenue. Now you, if you have a PC with this management software installed, uh, an attacker might try to use that to you know, pivot through your network to get uh, uh, somewhere else, maybe to an engineering system. Um, I think an area of more research to do uh, with serial converters is to look at these um, what, what are called real port or virtual COM port protocols. So we talked uh, mostly about management protocols on the serial converters today. Uh, most of the serial converters, uh, obviously they, they tunnel serial data inside of a TCP stream. Uh, and a lot of the serial converters have special drivers for Windows where the Windows operating system will think it's a local serial port that it's talking to, but really that, uh, that special driver is tunneling the traffic over the TCP protocol to the serial converter. I think that that driver is a, a, a space for more research, frankly. Uh, you know, reverse engineering that driver is something that we'll probably take up uh, next. Um, so finally, a kind of base camp style reveal. Um, we uh, rated the serial converters uh, based on the vulnerabilities that they had. Uh, we have uh, column A here representing the uh, Moxa Nport 5000 series. Column B is the Nport 6000 series. C and D are the uh, Lantronics and Grid Connect devices. And then the column E is the DG1 SP. Uh, and we give them a, a red X saying that they uh, had some serious failure in an area. 
uh, a yellow exclamation point means that there was some some badness going on, maybe not something that completely compromised the device, but uh, maybe crashed the device and it was recoverable. Uh, and then a green check mark means that the device passed the testing. So Moxa has you know, a little bit of good going for it in that uh, we could fuzz test the web server and the other protocol ports and didn't get any crashes. But of course, if the device does crash on their 5000 series line, um, so that is the end of the presentation. I guess, uh, are there any questions? Any questions for Reed? You know, I, th I think one thing you talk about, uh, the serial to ethernet converters are, are very famous now because of Ukraine with the concept of uh, breaking them, making them useless, so they have to be replaced. And, and if you didn't follow that, it took Ukraine about two months to recover their SCADA system. I'm not sure it was all the serial to Ethernet converters. It could have been other things. But if you're able to load firmware on there, I would imagine, can you talk at all about being able to hide attack code that, you know, even if someone is securing their PCs and other things, how they could use these as good ways to hang out in a network until they want to launch an attack? Certainly. Uh, I think it would be difficult to do that, but certainly not impossible. Um, so in the case of the Moxa converters, they use that special CPU uh, that there's not a lot of public detail on. So uh, to develop uh, that kind of hidden attack code for the Moxa devices would be difficult, I think certainly possible. Uh, but I, I would not want to do it unless somebody was paying me a lot of money uh, because it's a fairly painful process to you know, learn uh, the inner workings of a CPU for which uh, the, there is not too much documentation. Uh, the Lantronics converters would actually make a, a more interesting uh, attack example for that because the, they use a, a, basically a processor that's based on uh, Intel CPUs. So yeah, you could create uh, a, a small listening server on the, you know, on the converter that, that sits dormant for a long time and uh, gives you uh, maybe a way to pivot through the converter uh, or a persistence on the converter, uh, maybe a way to tunnel out of the control systems network to uh, give you a way back into the control systems network. Um, and none of these converters have any way of, uh, you know, attesting the firmware, which means that you can't verify the firmware running on the converter is the legitimate firmware that comes from the manufacturer. Uh, so, yeah, I would make a nice, nice uh, attack uh, mechanism in that respect. And, and probably very useful for persistence, too. So if, you, right. if, if someone caught you on the PCs, clean those all up, and then it had some job to periodically launch and reinfect. It could be pretty That's nasty, because there aren't a lot true. of forensics for serial to Ethernet gateways yet. Right. So yeah. far as I know, none. And in fact, uh, you know, given the proprietary chips in many of these, developing the forensics tools would be quite difficult, <laughs> just as difficult as developing exploits. Hmm. So, Any other? OK, we have another question back here. Do I need to introduce myself? Um, Ganesh Shati from Arctic Associates, India. So you've uh, listed all the vulnerabilities and the uh, serial to Ethernet converters. So what, what solutions do we have? I mean, it seems like complete systems are vulnerable and... Right. Uh, the reason I mention, for example, the ports used for these management protocols is to give people a good guideline for what to block at their network perimeter. Uh, and maybe they sh people should pay attention to the traffic ongoing on their network to see, you know, right. if anything is communicating with these special management ports. That might be something that they want to look at more deeply. I think in this case, the best defenses are perimeter protection and network monitoring, frankly. Right.